This is going to be different. So you're not going to get like an economic development essay. We're going to instead go on a little journey, okay? And uh, you know, the thing that I love, I love cities. I love studying cities. I love visiting cities. I, I'll be in Prague on uh, Thursday. And then we'll be taking a little trip just walking down or walking down, driving down to Slovenia uh, to go visit somebody about m possibly moving an LED manufacturing facility to the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, but here's something about cities. Cities are resilient, okay? Throughout history, cities have been burnt to the ground. They've been flooded. They've been bombed. They've seen natural disasters. They've seen unemployment and everything. And what, what happens with the city, it's like an organism. It sort of comes back. It has an ability to redefine itself and to rebuild itself. So tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to go on a little, little history tour of Pittsburgh. We're going to go all the way back to before there were Europeans here. And we're going to go up to today, and then we're going to look at some of the challenges. And what I want you to do as we go through this is start thinking about what are some of the patterns that we've seen in Pittsburgh? What are those common threads that took it from a western frontier city to the head of the industrial era for this entire country to what we call the Renaissance when we started to transform out to what we're at now, which we don't really have a definition of, but it's something different than all those other three. And then looking back at all the different time periods, the challenges that those people faced how they were able to address them, what they did and how they invested their own money to do so, and then what challenges we're going to face and what tools we have to be able to do the same thing. So how many people here were born and raised in Pittsburgh? There's a lot of us. All right, that's good. Me too. Uh, how many are Carnegie Mellon University students? How many are not? How many are Oakland Catholic students? <laughs> okay. I, I saw the gray skirt. Uh, <laughs> so. What we're going to do is to sort of hopefully get a, a feeling about this city. You know, I, I, like I said, I, I travel cities. That's, that's my hobby. When I travel them, I look at things like the sidewalk and the, the grates around the trees and the garbage cans. And you can tell the cities that invest in care on the little things. And, you know, that, that's, I'm a big proponent of that broken window theory. But my favorite city in the world is this city. And there were times it was really hard to stay here, but stuck it out, and I'm pretty happy that I did. So let's go on that tour, okay? It's, uh, this was a, a presentation partly that I did in Stockholm in July uh, before a European conference where I was one of the only two North Americans, the president of the Chamber of Commerce of Montreal and myself who were asked to speak. And at the end of it, I had people falling in love with Pittsburgh. I used video though in that one. I took the video out of this one, but it, I hope you can still get the same, same idea. So this was the idea for the Europeans. They saw this area as the strategic location. This was the gateway to the West. It's the area where the, really, the, the settling ended, but it also provided this great opportunity to be able to go past. And why was that? It's because of the reason that the Native Americans settled here. It's the reason that everything has happened here. The rivers, the water, the ability to sustain life, the ability to move things, the ability to do things with it. And so Pittsburgh became a French fortress. Um, you know, geographically, when I talk to people about it, I like to show them the little shining light that we are, but we're also centrally located with all the other development that has occurred in American history around us as well. In fact, we've got a very strategic advantage that way. So Native Americans came here. That's a beautiful shot, isn't it? They're up on Troy Hill, I guess, looking over. That's probably where North Catholic is now. Um, but they came here because of the, the same reason that the French settlers came here, because of this this amazing location. So as you probably know, the French and Indian War was started here. Uh, it was the world's first world war. Uh, it spread over three continents. Uh, but it was started by a guy named George Washington, who uh, was trekking back through the woods out by Ligonier in the Laurel Highlands, came across some French who were camped out there, a young ensign named Jamonville, and killed them as they slept. And the French didn't like that too much, and so they started a war. The war was basically fought over the forks of the Ohio down at the point. Who would control that? Would control the destiny of this entire continent. And this area became the center of, like I said, the First World War. Um, the British eventually won, and they came by and they said, we will rename this area after the Earl of Chatham, uh, William Pitt. 
and we will call this Pitts Borough. And we were a borough up until 1816 when we actually became a city. Uh, and Pitts Borough was one of the reasons why we had the H and still have the H at the end. Obviously it was from an old Scottish uh, namesake. So Pittsburgh becomes the fortress to the west. The British build Fort Pitt. They start looking at this area as, a, as an area where expansion can occur. Um, by the end of the Revolutionary War, the, the fortress town has grown. It's not simply a fort with a little bit of development around it. It's starting to grow out and being planned. And kind of interesting too because um, we still have these two crazy grid systems, you know? <laughs> it doesn't really work. You, you, up at places like South Negley out in Friendship and you're like why are there five intersections all coming together because when these guys were designing this and again our buddy George Washington is the guy who surveyed Penn Avenue he was a young major in the front or the Virginia militia he came down looked at this crazy road and built Penn Avenue all the way out to Route 30 to where he killed that young Ensign Jamonville and this whole area has been designed this way this also gives us a good opportunity too right because we could have bus transit systems that go in loops and we can take all those buses out downtown but pretty much from uh, the early days of 1784 when this city was first designed we've pretty much stayed to that original intent of design uh, the city itself started to grow along the rivers from a fortress town it became a nice little city on, on the rivers and then by 1804 it was the starting point for Lewis and Clark and that really ended the idea of the fortress town because as Lewis and Clark started to get ready down by the West End, across from the West End down by where Heinz Field is and loading their boats up and getting ready to take off past Bruno's Island and down and seeing the rest of America, America started looking further west too. So all of a sudden, this initial city which was created to be the Western Frontier City, which was created to be a fort city, was now going to become something very different. And these guys knew it because America was moving west. Our role in that early part of this country was basically the starting off point. We were the f as far as people would go and then we became the launch point to creating a whole, new, a whole new country. So now what happens? Well, that little fortress town now starts to become a city. And like I said in 1816, uh, a guy by the name of Ebenezer Denny was elected the first mayor of the city of Pittsburgh in the July of 1816. And people may say, wait a minute, didn't we celebrate a 250th anniversary? Well, that was when the French blew up Fort Duquesne and the British came in. But in 1816 is when Pittsburgh actually became a city. So we're going to be celebrating the 200th anniversary of our city very soon. And it became a city of industry. And the first industry was not steel. The first industry was glass. And Pittsburgh became the, the largest glass maker uh, in North America. A lot of factories down along the south side where guys like John Brashear would work. Um, the idea of being able to produce glass though, and this is where I want you to start thinking about these things that connect. It wasn't just because people had the skill to make glass. It was because they had the access to the river to move the glass so that all these new cities that were being produced further down the Ohio like Cincinnati and St. Louis now had a distribution and the distribution in the infrastructure was rivers. There was also a whole new infrastructure system being created at that same time called the railroads. And the railroad systems would connect through Pittsburgh so that the infrastructure between rail and river would provide this city with the opportunity to expand its industry which at the time was glass manufacturing. Um, it's the, the two major routes were either through rail or through river and it became that way for many many years. Yeah we lost that H for a little while too. Uh, they, they decided to standardize the spelling of cities throughout the, the, the United States through an act of Congress and we literally had to go back to Congress and fight for our H. So we got it back. <laughs> this is what Pittsburgh looked like back then. The downtown, the riverfront was the entire city. It would go out to as far as Lawrenceville where the first settlers in the 1840s and 1830s who were of a different denomination, something called Catholics would settle and they would start in Lawrenceville and the other area, mainly from two areas, Germany and Ireland. Um, and actually during that time, we fought 
with another issue, racism. Uh, in 1850, uh, a person was elected mayor, and Joe Barker was his name. He was a street preacher. He preached on the streets of hatred and intolerance towards the Catholics. And he threatened to kill the bishop, so they put him in jail. And while in jail, his friends said, hey, you know who'd make a great mayor? Joe Barker. So they ran him as a write-in candidate on a new party, not a Whig, not a Democrat, not a Republican. He ran as the anti-Catholic party, and he won. And his friends busted him out of prison. They pulled him into the mayor's office, and the judge had to say, whoa, Joe, you got to go back to jail. <laughs> you got to finish your sentence, and you don't get to become mayor till January. So Joe came back in January, became the mayor of the city of Pittsburgh. First thing he did, fired all the police. Hired his friends to become the police. So now you have a civil war in the streets of Pittsburgh, right? And then the next thing he does is he imprisons the bishop. He says the bishop illegally had a sewer tap in at Mercy Hospital. And so the bishop's in prison, and what happens while the bishop's in prison? The Catholic cathedral is burned to the ground, which is now the location of Frick Building. Um, and they were never, those police officers were never able to find out who did it. So there's this history that if you think about what we're facing now with immigration reform, immigration laws, really isn't that much different than what they were facing back then. The only difference now is the majority of the population in Pittsburgh is Catholic. Kings of industry, the Gilded Age. These were the guys that were starting to push this new industry into a much different direction. They were the ones that were starting to be able to put together different networks and systems in order to make Pittsburgh more than just a manufacturing center but the world leader in manufacturing. The rivers then became even more different, not no longer just a few manufacturing plants, but the entire riverfront became a manufacturing center. And again, the railroads and the river became the transportation routes that linked it to the entire country. The city, though, wasn't really that great. A lot of those uh, people who were coming from those different countries didn't really share in the prosperity that was being created during this next phase of Pittsburgh's history. The industrial phase didn't include everyone in it to receiving the same benefits. There were the haves and the have-nots. The South and Eastern European population continued to grow, represented by the blue in these different charts for the different time periods. And what they came for were jobs. But again, the jobs wouldn't provide them with an opportunity to do much more than to work, live, and die. Um, go to the next one. The city itself, just some beautiful shots of it. There's something that is, to me, romantically beautiful about steel mills, uh, even the old rusted ones that are still around. I find it to be not urban blight, but as beautiful as a beach. Uh, and I know there's other people that see it that same way. And if you're ever in Braddock, which I really suggest you go to. And you look at night and you can still see the flames that light up the sky from, from the, uh, one of the remaining steel mills that are still there. Yeah, it's beautiful. It, it has a certain way to it. And then when you add to it, just in the front, the different steeples of the churches, it, it says Western Pennsylvania probably better than anything else. So what does the, 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 the ones that had built, they built temples. They built these new constructed beautiful buildings because steel now was being used to build buildings and the entire idea of architecture started to get transformed. And they left us with this incredible architecture and beautiful downtown that has these buildings still there. But it wasn't being shared. The, even the, the wealth of this region to be able to build a courthouse like this. If you could imagine if a politician proposed building something like this, they would be voted out of office the next day. Uh, but at this, that, this time, we were the Seattle. We had more money than we knew what to do with. And we put it into beautiful places. Also invested in something different. In the 1890s, we started investing in parks. And in fact, a park system in this, in this city was created by women. Uh, Mary Shenley, uh, who was a young woman who was eloping to marry a much older British uh, officer, uh, was chased as she was leaving on one steamer by another steamer by a guy named Bigelow. You might have heard of the street named after him, but he was uh, the director of public works for the city. And he made sure that everything behind us, Shenley Park, became an asset of the city. Behind him on the next steamer were developers who wanted the land to build houses. He got there first. 
beautiful park systems, it's park systems that were to be shared by all so that there would be some of this prosperity sharing by investing it in public spaces. An amazing concept back then, but it were happening all throughout the world in the 1890s, 1910s, 1920s. Frick Park, again, Helen Clay Frick, who on her 16th birthday as a debutante was taken to New York by her father and was told that they were going to have this grand party for her with the Rockefellers and everyone else. And she ended up the night before getting on a train and coming back to Pittsburgh with her mom. And her dad had promised her something for her debutante birthday. She could have anything in the world that she wanted. And she said, I'd like to give to the kids of Pittsburgh the place where I get to ride my pony and be able to share it with them. And Frick Park was created. Kind of amazing women, huh? Young women, then their, their testament and their legacy lives on generation after generation after generation. Institutions, the investment back into education. Andy was a smart guy when he built this building. He made sure that it was on a slope, right? Did you notice that slope when you're out there? So that if it failed as an institution for academics, he could easily turn it into an assembly line. <laughs> Cathedral of Learning. And the people who were coming over from Europe, many of them who worked at this building, came over from the same uh, part of Italy as my grandfather. They came from the area of Abruzzo. And they were able, they, they worked with their hands to build stone. And very interesting, the people who came and built this, this building, the Cathedral of Learning, Many of them went back to Italy after they made their money, and they went back to the villages. And in World War II, as the American soldiers started to come up from Sicily and march up through Italy, the Nazis came into that village, and they asked, does anybody here speak English? And the guys from Pittsburgh raised their hands, we speak English, and they killed them all um, because they didn't want them to be able to speak to the American soldiers about the operations. And their names are Di Pasquale, uh, Donardo, Scholli, names that we still know in Pittsburgh, and they were their family members who helped to build this. And uh, into the arts, into, this is the uh, soldiers and sailors, and you may not recognize it because of the towers, but that is Carnegie Museum. And then something else came up. In 1908, basically led by nonprofits, there became a very strong concern that Pittsburgh had become a place where there was great wealth, great opulence, and great poverty. And that there needed to be a way to be able to, to change that. But the political structure was so strong that it really needed something that could cut through it. And the Pittsburgh survey was conducted in 1908. And it was the leading national ex examination of a city's health. Uh, and looked at the living conditions of the Pittsburgh workers. And it shined a light, and it would, it would go into magazines around the country for years to come. It shined a light on what the conditions really were, and it made people then start to respond of how they could make it better. The conditions for workers, and this is just down probably in Oakland or any other area where the workers gathered, uh, was not a life that was worth living. They weren't going to Highland Park to use the trails, or to Shenley, or to Frick. They were just getting by. This family eats, sleeps, and makes stogies in one room on Poplar Alley. Typhoid fever was epidemic in Pittsburgh for more than 35 years. Insufficient toilets, toilets just basically put right onto it. So even in the areas right outside the Cathedral of Learning, the streets weren't paved, they weren't even brick, they were mud. It was a very different lifestyle a city that had gone from a little fortress town to this industrial era hadn't taken everyone around for the ride. We were one of the wealthiest cities in the world, and yet we had the, well, some of the greatest poverty at the same time. And it was really only through the collective action of the people themselves that the change started to happen. And it was through the actions of organizing with the AFL and the CIO and working in the mills so that people who had little or no skills were able to transform their life to be able to earn into a middle class. I can speak to this firsthand because my grandfather was one of those people. He came over in 1921 with a second grade education. My grandmother had none. She never walked into a school. He worked at Columbia Steel in Carnegie and in the 1930s uh, was asked to sign a paper to join a union. He raised his hand at the meeting and asked one question. 
if I sign, does that mean I can work every day? And they said, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. And he signed and he was fired. Uh, but they had to call him back because they needed people to make steel. And eventually he was able to join that union. He was able to send his youngest son, my uncle, to college. He was able to give my mom a life that was in middle class. And he was able to live a life that was vastly different than that transformation that we saw till an industrial era. So, now we're at the next phase. Pittsburgh's transformed itself. It's coming into a new era. It's still an industrial leader, but there's warning signs about how long it can continue in a manufacturing heavy industry. And those warning signs are coming from the, the heads of industry. They're coming from government officials. And they're starting to look at ways because basically we had destroyed everything in our progress. We had destroyed the environment. Those rivers that we talked about were contaminated. The air was killing people. There were was, there was still not great living conditions for the people who lived here. So there had to be something that was transformative to make it so that this, this city could be around for a long time. Uh, that's what they had to work with. They had to work with rivers that were completely industrial. And there was a new team that was put together. The guy right here, hopefully I get to sit in his desk in four months, his name is David Lawrence. And David Lawrence worked with people such as uh, the Mellons and others to form a new organization called the Allegheny Conference. He worked with economic leaders in order to come up with some new ideas. And a lot of the ways that he approached it are completely different than what we will ever consider doing in the future. But it was a new novel approach for them to how they could tr try to deal with urban blight and also changing the city. That's the area um, that we now know is Consul Energy Center. Uh, this used to be a place called the Hill District. <laughs> um, and the idea was with uh, David Lawrence that if we're going to see this start to continue to expand, we have to demolish all of this. And you know what? This is where people lived. And these were people's homes and businesses. But there was this idea that through urban redevelopment, we would just take large swaths of land, demolish and rebuild. Pittsburgh itself, that's 10 o'clock in the morning, not 10 o'clock at night. Um, the pollution, the industry, this is the point. It's your downtown. You can see the point looks vastly different now, obviously. Um, it was just an industrial wasteland. And the idea was how could they transform that? Ellen, like I said, was the partner of David Lawrence. They didn't just say, okay, well, we don't have much ability to do things, but we'll have to do the best we can. They created whole new systems. The whole idea of an urban redevelopment authority was created by these guys. So the, the, the city could borrow money from a different organization, leverage its own money, do redevelopment on a massive scale, and be able to see change happen, but not do it through the budget of the city's budget. The Allegheny Conference was all the CEOs of this town who got together and they decided we have to invest back in order to do it. You know, the difference is between then and now that the CEOs of Mellon were the Mellons. The CEOs of Heinz were the Heinz. The CEOs of Alcoa were the Hunts. The families themselves were still running the company. And there was a more intrinsic value given to giving back than just to the shareholders. These were the organizations they created. These were the visions they had, a new airport, uh, redeveloping the corporate downtown center, uh, a new arena uh, that would be the home of the Pittsburgh Opera. There was no hockey back then. There was, but they were playing down in Craig Street. This is what they had to work with. And they designed it. They designed, it a, designed a whole new corporate headquarters for Pittsburgh that would make Pittsburgh the third largest corporate headquarters in America. New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh. They looked at the areas that they felt were blighted and looked at ways to redo them through demolition. There's an idea of where the uh, arena sat and what was there originally and the streetscape that was there of that neighborhood called the Hill District. There's the arena under construction. And you can see how much of it was demolished in order to build that. We want to make sure we don't make that same mistake twice. 
These were areas of East Liberty. 